Hi, Professor Rapetti here again today, Rick Rapetti. And today's philosophy lecture will be on Aristotle, one of the greatest philosophers of all time, student of Plato's. And as you can see in the slides, the inventor of both logic and biology. He also wrote tremendously insightful, comprehensive philosophical and or scientific works on physics, metaphysics, ethics. Of course, he defined definition, which enabled him to do logic and biology, politics, anthropology, rhetoric, tragedy, drama, psychology, all sorts of things. That's why the et cetera is there. Okay. And there's an arrow hitting the bullseye because Aristotle was quite good at demonstrating how philosophical analysis enables you to zero in on and hit the bullseye on insight and understanding. Okay, so logic, let's talk about it. One of the foundational axioms, postulates, or principles of logic, according to Aristotle, is the law of identity, which seems so simple as to go without saying, but a simple way of explaining it is that a thing is what it is, and it's nothing else right? Or as might be put into a shorthand, A is A, where the letter A is a variable for any kind of thing whatsoever. For example, a horse is a horse. Now, the principle of identity applies a kind of principle of non-identity, which is that a thing is not what it's not. So A is not the same as not A, right? Not A is the opposite of A, so they can't be the same. A horse isn't a cow, right? If a horse is an A, using the letter A, like the variable X in math, right? And a cow is therefore something else, it is a non-A. So an A is never a non-A, right? Law of identity and the law of non-identity kind of imply each other in a way. Okay. So if you kind of unite them, you get something like the law of non-contradiction. Um, something can't be an A and a not A, <laughs> right? It is what it is, and it's not what it's not in, in so many words, right? Something can't both be a horse and a non-horse, right? But two different names can name the same thing, like Clark Kent and Superman. Right. So, you know, the mere fact that you could have an A being the same as a B doesn't mean that the anything can be the same as the negation of itself. Right. Like an A is not a not A. <laughs> right. So a Superman can be a Clark Kent, but that doesn't imply that a Superman can be a non-Superman, okay? So that's, that's my example. Okay, Aristotle defined definition, and maybe I should have put this first. Um, I believe he got the idea from watching Socrates, and I mentioned this in my lecture on Socrates in Plato's Euthyphro dialogue, when Socrates was questioning Euthyphro to help him come upon his final definition of piety or holiness, Socrates asked Euthyphro, what kind of thing is piety um, compared to something like justice? Like, which of the two is the larger conceptual category, right? And then Euthyphro said, well, first he didn't understand, but once Socrates explained by analogy to him with even numbers or odd numbers versus numbers, 
numbers is the larger category. Euthyphro got where Socrates was going and he said, oh, justice is, piety is a kind of justice. So all kinds of piety are all kinds of justice relationships, but not all justice relationships are kinds of piety, just like not all numbers are even numbers, but all even numbers are numbers, right? So the larger category in both cases is what Aristotle called the genus, a word we still use today. And then Socrates asked Euthyphro, what differentiates piety from other forms of justice? What's unique about it? And he said, oh, it's that kind of justice that concerns men's proper relationship with gods, right? And then you put those two together. That's the species Aristotle called it, a term we still use, right? One species differs from another species, even if they're in this larger family or genus of similar species, right? Um, so when you give the genus and the species of a thing, you've defined it, right? So the genus is the smallest conceptual category of a thing, like, brother. You could say, oh, a brother is a relative or a family member, but that's a very large category that includes all other kinds of things, right? The smallest conceptual category that brother belongs in is sibling, right? And then that's the genus, sibling. So if you ask, okay, what differentiates brothers from other kinds of siblings, then the answer is being male or maleness or just male. And being male is the species of siblings, which are brothers. So then you put those two, the genus and the species together, and you get the definition of brother. A brother is a male sibling, okay? So now, given the law of identity, a non-identity or the law of non-contradiction, those are sort of mutually entailing principles. And I'm specifying them informally just so you understand them rather than giving logical, you know, formal explanations of them. I want you to just understand these concepts. You can understand how Aristotle erected an entire system or science of logic on these simplest of ideas. And logic is the study of the relationships between concept categories for Aristotle, right? Like inclusion and exclusion, almost like sets, or which category is the larger or the smaller. This, this category is a member of this larger category, and that larger category is a member of a still larger category in which case the first category is the, a member of the largest category, right? Those are logical conceptual category relationships that are almost mathematical. In a sense, they, they can be formalized as mathematical relationships. And mathematics is just a kind of uh, logic applied to a subset of conceptual categories that are spatial. Right? So mathematics, in a sense, is a species of logic that applies to conceptual categories that are spatial in definition, right? They have spatial characteristics. Now, remember the word logic, by the way, comes from the word logos, which we've seen with the pre-Socratics who thought that, um, you know, the universe was a logo, some of them thought. The universe had some kind of logos to it, meaning it had a hidden meaning, like a word. A word is a signal. If you don't speak the language, then a word that you hear is a code. It's a secret code. It's encrypted. And if you don't have the code, you can't decrypt and get that information about what it means. What does it signify? What does it re refer to? There's information encoded in that secret word that you don't know, right? So Logos with a capital L is the idea that the whole universe is loaded with information. But if we could decrypt it, then we could have all this knowledge about reality, right? So that's the big capital L Logos. But the word Logos in ordinary ancient Greek just means the word word, right? So 
words have meanings, right? If you define a word, then you specify its meaning, its conceptual meaning, right? So logic, which is kind of logosology, right, is the study of word meanings or concept meanings and their relationships, right? Of course, all words ending in ology come from the word logos also, because any word ending in ology is the study of the word that ology is appended to, like biology is the study of life, right? There it is, biology. Down below is anthropology, the study of anthropos, mankind, right? Ology comes from the word logos, words about, meanings about, information about, logic about the subject is blankology, right? Logic of blank expressed in words, in definitions, which signify concepts. Okay, see the relationships here? So simply by defining definition and intuiting and articulating the law of identity and the law of non-contradiction and seeing how those things relate to each other, Aristotle invented logic in the same way that Euclid, one of his colleagues in Plato's Academy, invented the logic of spatial relations, geometry, right? Mathematics. Amazing that Plato had both Euclid and Aristotle as his students. One invented the logic of space. The other one invented the logic of more generally concepts, and conceptual relationships, or just logic, right? Math being a species of logic in a sense. Okay. So, Aristotle's particular logic employed what he called the syllogism. And that's a specific type of argument, right? What is an argument? An argument in the philosophical sense is not when you bicker with your partner or something like that, or with some stranger on a subway who jacked you out to get the seat or something like that, right? In philosophy and in law and in science and in math, uh, an argument is when you give premises and a conclusion, or at least one premise. And a premise is what? It's a reason for the conclusion, or it's evidence for the conclusion, or it's grounds for the conclusion. You stand on the premises, so you stand on the grounds, you stand on the supports. What you stand on supports you, right? Then a conclusion is a claim or statement or proposition that is supported by a premise or by a reason or by evidence or more than one of those, right? So that's an argument and almost all of Western philosophy focuses on creating and evaluating and interpreting and assessing and weighing and counteracting and rebutting arguments, right? In ordinary language, an argument is a belief that you have and the reasons why. So it's what you believe and why you believe it, right? In theory, we're concerned with both, of course, but philosophers are usually more concerned with why than with what. Of course, what you believe is fascinating and interesting. And of course, we couldn't be interested in why you believe something if we didn't know what it was that you believe, right? But arguments are just what and why combined. What you believe and why, okay? Premises and conclusion. Syllogism is Aristotle's preferred method of argument because it spells out the ways in which two premises can lead to a conclusion, whereas one premise could lead to a conclusion, but the logic is not really obvious in that case, right? It's be, just think of if a proposition were to be abbreviated by the letter P, which we do in logic, right? P could stand for um, let me see, think of something. Today is Tuesday, right? The letter P represents that proposition. So if that was my premise, today is Tuesday, and my conclusion was today is Tuesday. Right? That would be saying something like P, therefore P. 
Of course, if P is true, then it follows logically that P is true, but that doesn't give you any reason for thinking that P is true to begin with, right? So that would be a one premise argument, right? So Aristotle tries to give two premise arguments. There could be more than two, but at least two premises, right? And so when an argument has two premises and a conclusion, he calls it a syllogism, particularly if the first premise is a major premise and the second premise is a major, minor premise. It doesn't matter which comes first or second the logic will still work. And I will explain this in a moment, right? But there's a way in which something transitions or transfers through the two premises or across them leading to the conclusion. And that transferring relationship we call transitivity. Let me give you an example in ordinary English. If John is taller than Mary and Mary is taller than Pete, then it's transitive, the relationship is taller than, right? right? And, and what does that mean? That means if John is taller than Mary and Mary, Mary is taller than Pete, this is Pete's height, this is Mary's height, and this is John's height. If John is taller than Mary and Mary is taller than Pete, then John is taller than Pete. So the relationship is taller than is said to be transitive, right? Logic is all about transitivity across the premises to the conclusion, right? If five is bigger than three and three is bigger than one, then five is bigger than one. Not all things that look transitive are transitive, however, right? If Repetti can beat up Jones in a martial arts context, contest, and Jones can beat up Smith in a martial arts contest, it doesn't follow logically that Repetti can beat up Smith. Repetti's skills might work good against Jones and Jones's skills might work good against Smith, but that doesn't mean Repetti's skills will work against Smith, see? Although it looks like is taller than, right? So can beat up is not necessarily transitive. It might frequently be, but not logically. It doesn't always work, right? So here's a, the classic example of an Aristotelian also known as a categorical syllogism. Why? Because instead of using the letter P, like we do in modern logic to represent a whole proposition, right? If P then Q, if Q then R, therefore, if P then R, right? Which is very similar, right? Those, that's called propositional logic. That's about when whole propositions have transitivity relationships, right? If P then Q, if Q then R, therefore if P then R, right? Aristotle focused on conceptual categories having transitivity relationships, right? So when he says all A's are B's, he's talking about the kinds of categories that go into definitions, right? Like if all brothers are male, right? That's A, if all A's are B's, and B, all males have, um, uh, what is it called? Um, a certain chromosome, right? I forget the XY, XXY, whatever, right? Have certain chromosomes, right? Then all males, um, wait, yeah, all, I lost my train of thought. If all brothers are males, well, brothers, okay, that's A's or B's. And all males have a certain chromosome, then all brothers, that's the conclusion, thus all A's or C's, all brothers have that chromosome, right? That's the idea. That's a classical Aristotelian or categorical syllogism or argument form. A syllogism is a specific type of argument, an argument that has this form, what? Like all A's are B's, all B's are C's, therefore all A's are C's. And there are other categorical syllogisms, right? Like all A's are B's, this individual X is an A, therefore this individual X is a B, right? That sort of thing, right? So we say that any argument that has that kind of logical structure is a valid argument, meaning it has good logic. There are no logical errors. It's logically impeccable. And how do we define 
validity, the validity of an argument is if it satisfies this criterion at the bottom of the page. If, emphasis on the word if, the premises were true, which doesn't mean that they are true or that they have to be true, but if they were true, then, this is an if then, if this condition is satisfied, then another condition is satisfied. If the premises were true, then the conclusion would have to be true. The conclusion must be true. Any argument that satisfies this criterion is valid. So look at the, the argument above. All A's are B's and all B's are C's. Well, we don't even know what A's and B's stand for. I gave you an example, right? Which happens to be true, right? Let's just say um, in some simple biological sense, right? Um, not just for humans, but we'll just say for cats, even, you know, for any species that has male and female members in it, right? Um, so, but it doesn't matter if the premises are true, right? If they were true, if all A's were B's and all B's were C's, it would have to be the case that all A's were C's, right? So that argument is valid. And we'll say more about this. So look, let me go through this slowly because I said a lot and I said it quickly. This is categorical logic. It has to do with conceptual categories, concept categories. What are they? Those are the things that structure definitions, right? Like a brother is what? What categories? It's a male and it's a sibling, right? So sibling is the larger category, Socrates would say. What's the larger category? Sibling, that's the genus. And what differentiates brothers from other siblings? Maleness. So male would be a subcategory in the larger category of sibling, right? So right here, A's would be like, say, siblings, right? And brothers would be a smaller circle inside the A's if we wanted to make the claim um, a brother is a male sibling, right? That sort of thing. But I'm not going to use that example going forward. I'm just using that to remind you that what, what are we looking at? What domain are we in? What universe of thought are we occupying here when we do this kind of logic? Concept categories, the things that make for definitions like male and sibling. Okay. So next slide. That's all A's or B's. That's how you would represent that. And we, we use a diagram. This is part of a Venn diagram structure here, but in a kind of loose, informal, I don't want to confuse you with all the rules about how Venn diagrams actually work, I'm making a much simpler version of a repetitious Venn diagram, right? So suppose that circle represents the entire category of whatever is an A, whatever A's are. They could be zebras, they could be tel telephones, they could be baseball caps, it doesn't matter. Walruses, philosophy professors, high school students, people with purple hair, people with ink all over their bodies, whatever, rock stars, right? This is the set of all rock stars or, or whatever, right? So everything inside that circle is an A, whatever A, A is a variable like X in math, which can represent any number, right? The category variable A can represent any category whatsoever. Right? So by drawing a circle, we say everything in that circle is an A, and that's how we would depict it in a Venn-like diagram. All things are A's would be in that circle. Next picture, look, it says A's turned into B's. So we would use a similar circle right, for another category. So this circle represents everything in that category. This circle represents everything in the other category. And this circle, every single category, you can represent it as a circle inside of which is every member of that category, right? If it's cats, then every cat in the universe is in that category, okay? Same thing for Cs, A's, B's, Cs, okay? So it's pretty simple when you're just saying, okay, this concept category, that concept category, the other concept category, right? Now, let me go back and show you what's the first claim say? All A's are B's, right? Now, how do we represent that? And then the second one, all B's are C's. So we're gonna go through that, okay? 
So there's A's, B's, and C's. Now, here's the claim in premise one. All A's are B's. All we did was put the category of A's inside of B's, right? Now look at this diagram. Everything that's inside the smaller circle is also inside the larger circle. And the larger circle is everything that's a B. So all of the A's are B's, right? You see that? It's pretty simple. According to the diagram, we don't know if all the B's are A's right? We would need a different diagram to do that. In fact, we'd have to have one circle that had A's and B's in it, <laughs> right? And then there'd be everything that was an A would also be a B, and everything that was a B would also be an A, right? But we don't know that all B's are A's, so we don't want to diagram it as if we knew that when we don't. So that's why we put, we want to claim only that all A's are B's, so we put the A's circle inside the B circle. That leaves open the possibility that some Bs are not A's, right? right? So maybe A's, all, all brothers are males, right? But not all males are brothers, right? That kind of thing. Okay. Now, second premise, all Bs are Cs. Same kind of thing. We wanna put the entire set of Bs inside the set of C's. So we just create a larger circle and call that the set C or the category C. Okay, so now all we did was, let's go back. There's the first premise, all A's are B's. We put the A inside the B. Next premise, all B's are C's. So we put the B's inside the C's, right? That's all we did, right? But notice all we did, we'll go back, is diagram the first premise and the second one, let me go back and remind you. First premise, all A's are B's. Oh, it says all A's and B's. That's a typo. I have to fix that, right? And then the next one, all B's are C's. The conclusion, therefore, or thus, all A's are C's. Let me remind you. It's valid. There it is. If the premises were true, then the conclusion must be true. Okay, so now look, that's the individual categories. But now here's the first premise. If it was true that all A's were B's, this is what it would look like, right? And if it was true, second premise, that all B's were C's, that's what it would look like. So the first diagram shows you what it would be like if the first premise was true, if, we don't know that all A's are B's, depends on what A and B is, right? But if all A's were B's, that's what it would look like if it was true. And if all B's really were C's, if the claim all B's are C's was true, this is what it would look like, right? So all we did was diagram what it would look like if the first two premises were true. We did not diagram the third claim the claim that all A's are C's. But look, that conclusion is already there. It's implied, which means even though it's not stated explicitly, when you say something aloud, you say it explicitly. But when you only convey the idea indirectly by something else that you say, we say that you, you implied it. I don't know who that is but I'm gonna go and pause. I'm not gonna pause this, so let's just take a little break here. Amazon, my apologies. Actually, it was UPS and um, it was a signature required thing and I forgot that it was coming, so. 
So you got a little break there. All right, so look, let's get back to this. An argument is valid, first bullet, if the second bullet criterion holds. If the premises were true, then the conclusion must be true, right? And all this diagram shows you is what it would look like if the premises were true. But the conclusion is already there. So there's no way for the premises to be true because that's what it would look like if they were true and for the conclusion to be false, right? The conclusion is implied, it's implicit. It's not stated explicitly, but it's already built into what was stated explicitly. What was stated explicitly was that all A's are B's and all B's are C's, right? And so the conclusion, all A's are C's is right there. The set of A's is inside the set of C's, or the category of A's is inside the category of C's, in which case the conclusion follows logically. It can't be the case that those premises are true and that conclusion is false. That being so, this satisfies the criterion of valid. It is a valid argument, and any argument that has that structure right? That syllogistic form, that logical form, that argument form is a valid argument, no matter what A, B, and C stand for, right? And that's one of the brilliant things of Aristotle, right? Identity, definition, concept category, inclusion and exclusion, logic, bam. Okay. Now let's look at some actual claims that are true and some that aren't. So here's an all A's or B's situation. All mice are rodents. And that's true, but it's not true that all rodents are mice. Right? Rats are rodents, but they're not mice. And there are other rodent, members of the rodent grouping of animals that are also not mice. Now, look at the next claim. All rodents are mammals. Well, that's true. Rodents are warm-blooded animals with mammary glands, which is what makes something a mammal, right? And a rodent is just a group of different species that have this, these features in common, right? They're somewhat related. Like primates includes monkeys, chimpanzees, gorillas, and humans, and lemurs, and all sorts of different orangutans and gorillas, and apes and whatnot, bonobos. All right, so this is a valid argument. If the premises were true, then the conclusion must be true. The conclusion is already built into it. It's implied or implicit. Therefore, the conclusion follows all mice or mammals. And those claims are true, right? So what the argument is not only valid, right? but the claims in it, the premises and the conclusion are all actually true, right? Validity is just about the logical relationship, right? Between categories, no matter what the categories are, right? If all A's are B's and all B's are C's, then all A's have to be C's, right? Now, that regardless of, that's regardless of what, what those categories stand for. And you need to know what a category stands for in order to know whether or not the premise is true, right? But in this case, the premises are true and therefore the conclusion is true, right? It's a valid argument because even if these premises were false, if they were true, the conclusion would have to be true, which is like what we just showed back here, right? Okay, but because they are true, we add a term for this, successful feature of a valid argument. We say it's sound, right? If the premises were false, but the argument was still valid, we would say it was unsound. Or if the argument had true premises, but the logic was bad, was invalid, that would also make it unsound. So an argument is unsound if it's either invalid or has any false premises. And it's sound only if it's both valid and has all true premises, okay? All right, um, before I go on to do mathematics uh, and biology practically, um, 
logic and mathematics applied to concepts of real living things like mice, rodents, and mammals gives you biology. Let me give you an example of an argument, which I don't have a diagram for, but um, which you might get a kick out of. All right, let me go back up to A's, B's, and C's. Suppose A's were horses, right? And B's were rodents and C's were mammals, right? Now, the claim would be all horses are rodents, all A's are B's, which is false. All horses are rodents, false, but that's what it would look like if they were. And all rodents are mammals, all bees are seas. That's true, right? So this could be tricky because then if you did the logic, the conclusion would be true. All horses are mammals, which happens to be true, but it's not true because they're rodents, because they're not rodents, right? So this argument would be technically valid because if all horses were rodents and all rodents were mammals, then all horses would be mammals. Well, horses happen to be mammals, but not for that reason. That's an illogical reason, so that argument would be unsound. Or, and, and that's tricky because the conclusion is still true, right? But the thing is, it's valid, right? Because if those premises were true, the conclusion would have to be true. But if any of the premises are false, then you can't know if the conclusion is true, right? Let me give you a worse example. All horses are rodents and all rodents are bananas, okay? It would follow logically that all horses are bananas if those premises were true, in which case that's a valid argument, but both premises are false. And so is the conclusion. And therefore that argument is valid, but unsound. Okay, so this is just a sample of some, some of the major syllogism types. Aristotle gave a whole bunch of different kinds of syllogisms, right? Some A's or B's, no A's or B's, all this kind of different structures, right? And then the Venn diagrams for them are, are a little more, comp much more complicated. But we don't need to go into that. Just enough for you to know that he invented logic and then he used logic to invent biology. Definitions, <coughs> genus and species, category inclusion, plus logic generated what we call taxonomy, an entire hierarchy of classification. Now, in his case, a hierarchy or a taxonomy of living things is biology, right? So definitions plus logic give you a taxonomy. So you could have a taxonomy of anything taxonomy of biology, a taxonomy of chemistry, a taxonomy of computer programs, whatever, right? Um, it's a hierarchy of classifications that tells you this is a member of that set, which is a member of that set or category and so on, right? And how they branch out, how they're alike and how they're different, where they fit in on the hierarchy of conceptual categories, right? So cats, here's an example of one long complicated syllogism, which happens to be true, uh, all the premises are true, and the logic is good, it's the same thing. It's transitivity in a very straightforward sequence, right? But maps out some biological taxonomy in the process. First premise, all cats are felines, all A's are B's, that's true. Second premise, all felines are mammals, B's are C's, all B's are C's. Third premise, all mammals are vertebrates, that means they have spines. That's spines will be the D. And I'm simplifying now, but that all mammals are vertebrates is to claim all C's or D's. All vertebrates are animals. They're living organisms, right? That's E, or a kind of living organism. What kind of living or organism? That's F, locomotive or organisms that can move themselves. <coughs> and what are organisms? They're living things. Thus, cats are living things, all A's or G's, right? Totally transitive all the way down and true. So it's valid and sound. Okay, so let's shift gears now and see just a different application of Aristotle's 
logical analysis toolkit applied to anthropology and ethics and politics and things like that. Uh, the transition will be gradual here, but Aristotle says, look, let's classify and differentiate between two different types of purpose. A purpose is an end state, a goal that you aspire toward, right? A final destination that you intend to arrive at. It's an intentional target, right? And the Greek word for all those concepts is telos, T-E-L-O-S. All right, so when we say that something is teleological, we mean that it's goal-oriented, okay? So he says, look, we're just seeing him apply this species, genus species thing again, right? So all teleological things are goal-oriented things, right? But he says, then there's two different kinds. One, he says, is instrumental, and the other is intrinsic. And um, there's that arrow in the bullseye again over there, which is meant to depict that when an arrow hits a bullseye, although it's conceivable that the wind could have picked one up off the floor and made it hit the dead center of a dartboard, that could happen. But in the normal game of darts, right, you aim at the bullseye and you succeed when the dart hits the bullseye. So aiming at the bullseye is your goal and hitting the bullseye is succeeding in your goal. That's teleological behavior, okay? So two different types, instrumental and intrinsic. Instrumental means this goal is only an instrument or a tool, right? Like a utensil that you use to do something else or to get something else, right? So it's something that you want or do or value because it leads to something else that you want or value, right? As opposed to something that you want to do, you want, you want to do or you value for its own sake, right? And we'll say more about these as we go along. So look in the second box on the left, money has no non-instrumental value. You might want it and love it and feel so happy that you have it, but that's really not what it seems. On Aristotle's analysis, money has no intrinsic value. It's just paper or whatever form the money comes in. Its value is purely instrumental. It's a tool. It, the only purpose that it has is in enabling you to get something else by using it, right? Like a hammer enables you to remove or nails or hammer them in, right? That's its purpose. It's telos, right? So the purpose of money is to get something else. It's not its own purpose, although we treat it as if, because it, it has such great value for us, but that value is all instrumental. Just having money and never being able to use it would be like having an infinite number of, uh, I don't know, blades of grass or something you, know, you have no use for, right? You want a soda, so you want money so that you can buy the soda, right? Money is a tool to get other things that you value for their own sake, like drinking the soda quenches your thirst, right? And that satisfies some goal of yours, all right? Money is a temporary goal or a stepping stone, stepping stone goal, right? It's a necessary mini goal on the way towards a greater goal, okay? And those greater goals, things that we want or do or value for their own sake are what we call non-instrumental goals or values or purposes or intrinsic, right? Intrinsic versus instrumental or intrinsic versus extrinsic, right? The value of money is not in itself, but it's external to it in terms of what it can do with something other than money, right? 
That's extrinsic versus intrinsic. Okay, so if something has intrinsic value, then doing it or experiencing it itself makes you happy. For example, children playing. Just playing is its own reward. That's something about human beings and even a couple of other species of animal that just playing brings enjoyment for its own sake. It brings pleasure or happiness. Pleasure and happiness and enjoyment are things that we value for their own sake. Just like well-being is a kind of deeper or more lasting thing than just a momentary state of happiness or a positive emotion that comes and goes, right? Well-being is a kind of systemic, constitutive happiness. I mean, constitutive meaning it constitutes you, well-being, like your condition as a human being, if you have well-being, is itself inherently satisfying, right? It's enjoyable just to be if you are in a wholesome, healthy state of well-being, right? Many of us consider beauty intrinsically valuable. Just taking in and beholding and looking at and appreciating or hearing or tasting or smelling something that we might call beautiful if we extend the meaning of it to apply that's a beautiful flavor right or a beautiful sound or a beautiful scent right as opposed to an ugly one right or love right being in a state that's properly characterized by the word love as opposed to some kind of pathological versions of things that are like substitutes for love or approximations at love, but being in a genuine state of love, many of us consider intrinsically rewarding, right? Okay, so back to the big picture, two kinds of telos or goal, instrumental, that's short-term towards some greater long-term goal and intrinsic, a goal that's worthwhile in itself. Okay. All right. So I, I think we did this in one of my very first lectures about finding your ikigai, your, it's a Japanese word, recall, for your reason for being, right? Like, why are you in college, right? What's your ultimate purpose? That's the kind of question Aristotle would ask. Like, okay, what's the final goal? Right? What do you really value in itself? Right? That's an icky guy related question. And one of Aristotle's primary claims in his book on ethics, I said we're leading into a anthropology and ethics, right? Human nature is anthropology and ethics is about optimal human flourishing for the kinds of beings that human beings are. So ethics and anthropology are kind of related. What kind of being is a human being? Right? And therefore, what are the conditions under which human beings flourish and attain well-being? Right? What's our ultimate purpose? Every action, Aristotle says, to try to answer that question, aims at the good. Right? And it'll take a while for us to understand what he means by the good. Right? But things that we say are good or bad, right? good obviously has some positive value. Right? So you might want to say initially every action, everything that we do aims at the good because everything that we do is either instrumental towards something else that we consider good in and of itself, right? Or the action itself aims directly at the good, like playing, you know, hide and seek uh, for a little kid is so enjoyable that it's the good for that kid. So we are always pursuing some value that we consider good or positive, right? Why do we do anything? I asked you this question in the Ikigai video, right? Why are you in college, right? Oh, you want a degree. Well, why do you want a degree? Because you want to get a good job, right? A well-paying job. Why do you want to get that good amount of money? Oh, so that you can do the kinds of things that you want to do. Well, why do you want to do those things? 
right? So we're, we're, we're analyzing our way through a series of related, causally related, we project, we hope that we have, our predictions are right, that by getting a college, uh, passing my classes, I'll get a degree in the major that works for me, that'll get me the kind of job that I want, that'll make the kind of money for me so that I could afford to buy and do the kinds of things I wanna buy and do, because why? And state, what's the ultimate telos, the final purpose, the final good that I'm aiming at? Happiness, well-being. I want to be happy. All feeling creatures, Aristotle thinks, always aim in everything that they do at the good. And the good is, in some sense, happiness. But not happiness, like I said, I hinted in the previous slide, not momentary happiness, right? I have an ice cream cone, uh, I might enjoy it, it gives me temporary happiness. Uh, then I ate too much of it and I get a brain freeze, I'm no longer happy, right? Uh, so happiness can be understood as temporary states of positive enjoyment. Those aren't the same things as well-being, which is a kind of generic or constitutional structure. Like if you are the right kind of way, functioning the right kind of way as a member of your species, right? You're experiencing well-being, and that's a more permanent feature of your existence, which inclines you toward states of happiness almost all the time, even if you get a brain freeze or something like that, right? So Aristotle makes this important distinction. The word the Greek word for happiness at the bottom of the page, eudaimonia, um, eudomini in modern Greek, I think is based on that, which means harmony, right? And the word harmony sounds like it comes from that, eudomini. Um, but see in the middle, you've got daemon there, D-A-E-M-O-N. Sometimes it's spelled D-A-I-M-O-N. Well, the English word demon comes from that. In English, a demon is an evil spirit, but in Greek, a demon is just a spirit, a daemon, not a demon. And the EU in front of it means good. Same EU that's in euthanasia. Thanatos means death. So a good death is when you put your pet to sleep, you know, it's a good death as opposed to a, you know, a painful death or euphoria. Uh, and other words like euphemism and so on. EU means good. And the IA at the end means something like ness as like in happiness or itty, right? Like the property of something, of being liquid, liquidity, right? Um, so eudaimonia means good spiritedness or something like that, right? So literally those roots mean good spiritedness. So if you have well-being, if your character is structured in such a way that you are good-spirited, right? You might want to say, you have eudaimonia or rumini. You have, in the modern Greek, harmony in your soul, something Plato talked about. Reason, will, and passion are united in the right proportions and in the right way, right? then you have harmony in your soul, you're good spirited, you're healthy, you're wholesome, you experience well-being, that's deeper and lasting happiness, eudaimonia, that's the good, that's at which every action aims, right? The value that every, every sentient being, every creature aims at its good, right? Sometimes with the wrong conception, right? Like, Given the economy, some people think maybe, you know, this particular sequence of college, degree, job, do certain things, become happy, might not really work, right? Or maybe I got the wrong degree because the whole market in that just flipped, right? Um, so the specifics of what will get an individual or even a whole species to attain its good, the good for that species, that's an empirical question, 
right? Empirical meaning has to do with the way things actually are structured in the world, right? Okay. Moving right along. Okay, so that was just an intro to some of the anthropology and the ethics of Aristotle's brilliant analysis. We're gonna say more about the ethics later. All right, but let's take a little segue into his metaphysics. Got a kind of Madonna thing going on over there. We are living in a material world and I am a material living in a material. All right, so Aristotle disagrees with Plato in terms of Plato's theory of the forms, right? If you recall, we did talk about Plato's belief that we're living in a world of shadows, but the philosopher using reason accesses eternal forms, which are even greater than pure concepts, right? The kinds of things Aristotle's working with, concepts, right? The Platonic philosopher somehow or another has a kind of mystical transcendence or ascension into a world of forms and pure ideas which are eternal, like mathematical truths and whatnot. And those are the real things, right? In the unchanging world of permanent truth, as opposed to the changing Heraclitean, the world Heracl Heraclitus described, the world of change, right? Plato's in the Parmenidean world where truth and reality never change. It's like a two-tiered system, right? Well, much as he loved his teacher, um, Aristotle studied with Plato for 20 years in Plato's academy, recall. He disagreed with Plato on that. And he thought that forms are actually just properties or features of matter, of material objects, right? Like your physique, Right. It's like something more like a physique. I have a certain physique, right? <laughs> and, um, but that's a feature of my body's shape and the parts of it in relationship to each other, right? You know, my muscle tones and my skeletal structure and all that sort of thing. There's no such thing as a physique without a body, all right? Of course, you know, you could draw a picture an outline of a physique, right? And make a model of it, but that would have to be a physical thing too. Well, you could think of what a physique is, but that's just the thought that is either true or false of my body, right? It's like, there's no such thing as a smile without a face, except for the Cheshire cat who would disappear, but its smile would linger on for a few moments. Well, that's a cartoon kind of idea, but in terms of Aristotle's very realistic, empirical approach, right? He's a kind of extremely rational guy, but also very commonsensical and very empirically oriented, right? Empirics, empirical thinkers think that the world of the five senses, the material world, that's where it's at course we have to use our rationality to understand it but that's what's real there's no separate immaterial world that's more real than this one as far as aristotle is concerned right there's no universal redness a form of redness that exists in some parmenides plato type invisible immaterial more real world than the redness of an actual apple or of blood when I cut my hand, right? Or of a strawberry, okay? So there's no immaterial world. We are living in a material world. Madonna should thank Aristotle for that, okay? For that idea. In any event, she means materialistic, wanting physical things. That's a different kind of materialism. Right. Metaphysical materialism is the belief that there's just a material world and that's it. Okay. Um, now on my last bullet there, it says loyalty to truth, not to friends. Aristotle said, yeah, you know, we need to be loyal to our teachers and our parents and all of that, but it's more important to be loyal to the truth. If you're a philosopher, you are a lover of truth. And Aristotle just didn't believe that Plato's theories were true. Many of them were, he thought but not this one, okay? 
okay, let's take a quick foray into, and we're going to say more about his metaphysics when we get to his physics later. Epistemology. Plato is a rationalist, right? Parmenides matters to him more than Heraclitus, the world of forms. Those are ideas, not objects of the senses. In fact, you can't use your senses to, to access the world of forms, but Aristotle's an empiricist, right? There are concepts and definitions like genus and species. Those are conceptual categories, but they're the categories of physical living things, of existing things, right? They're not out there in some invisible realm. Knowledge is acquired by direct contact through your senses with physical objects. You know about the redness of an apple because you see the red apple. You are acquainted with the color red by seeing red apples, not by intuiting redness in some philosophical inference of some sort, right? That's a kind of mystical enlightenment for Plato, right? No. Knowledge is acquired by direct contact through the senses, by direct acquaintance with substances and things and their properties, like wax and water and red apples and whatnot. There's no anagoge, to use Plato's term, ascent into the mystical realm of philosophical wisdom where Plato's forms are, according to Aristotle anyway. So Aristotle is like one of the champions of modern empiricists when they look back into the ancient world because unlike those empiricists before him who had a couple of freaky ideas, his ideas were pretty, pretty good. In fact, they were so good that they became the primary form of education in the university systems in Europe up until the Renaissance in the modern era when Galileo came along and rejected Aristotle's idea that everything has a telos, even physical objects. More on that later. Oh, more on that shortly, because now we're talking about physics. Okay, so, um, you know, you got those diagrams up there, physics, that's um, the modern understanding of physics, but the broader Aristotelian conception involves the science of all physical things, including acorns, right? So, and all of, all of Aristotle's logic and his, all of his knowledge and specific areas of knowledge is rooted in his logic, law of identity and his definitions and, and logical arguments, right? So A is A, tells you what kind of a thing a thing is, like an acorn is a kind of seed, right? It tells you its actual nature and properties, right? It's got a shape, a size, it's hard, on the outside, it's a little moist on the inside and whatnot, right? Its properties determine what its potential is, right? Aristotle explained things in terms of their actual properties and their potential future states given the functional properties that they actually possess, right? So, that tells you what it can do or what it can become. Like an acorn can become an oak tree, right? Its properties determine it's being a type of thing, right? Because if it was a liquid, then it wouldn't be an acorn, right? So it's got those properties that determine that it's an acorn, right? But it's being that kind of thing tells you what it is actually, right? It's a hard shell thing, et cetera, and what it is potentially. It's potentially an oak tree, right? And what is change for Aristotle? This Heraclitus idea that everything's always changing. Change is a movement from something's potentiality to its actuality, or from its earlier stages of actuality to the actualization of its potential later stages, right? So it's all about movement within actuality and potentiality. If this is the seed and this is an acorn, I'm um, sorry, an acorn seed and an oak tree in a later stage, right? The change is just simply a movement between potentiality, the potentiality of the, of the tree in the acorn 
right, is its goal, its telos. That's what it was designed to do to become an oak tree toward its actual, its potentiality actualized as an oak tree, right? So a seed is a potential tree and anything's potential is its telos, right? That's its purpose. The purpose of an acorn is to become an oak tree. So change, you see the little seed that starts to sprout and then it starts to grow and open up and get bigger and eventually you've got an oak tree, right? So I call this physics, not just biology because Aristotle thought everything in the universe has a telos and this actuality potentiality mechanism kind of like um, was it Anaximenes had the um, condensation and evaporation as the two kinds of forces that explain change, right? Well, for Aristotle, it's actuality and potentiality, which is just the way of potentiality you might want to think of as kind of stored energy, right? Or kinetic energy. It's going to unfold and become that the way seeds unfold and become trees. Okay. So let's go into this a little more. He goes a little deeper when he says, well, let's go back for a moment and look at that acorn, right? Okay, just keep that acorn in mind. Aristotle said to explain anything like an acorn is to identify four things that he called causes, right? And we use the word cause in a narrow sense, only as the third bullet here, right? Which I'll explain when we get to it. But Aristotle thought that anything that plays into the conditions that cause a thing to be, to be or become what it is or what it does become, right? Which is what kind of matter it is, what kind of conditions it's under, you know, what structure it has, or, you know, and what the built-in purpose, its function, is, it's designed to become a certain kind of thing. All of those things are part of what cause it to be what it is. So he called all four of those different things, which we'll break down in a moment, the four causes, right? His theory of the four causes. You might want to say the four causal factors that need to be accounted for in order to fully explain what a thing is and how it behaves, okay? So the first, first bullet is its material cause. What kind of material is it made out of? And the word matter and the word material are, you know, one is derived from the other, right? The word material means some kind of matter. What kind of material is this? What kind of matter is it, right? So when we think of, Let's say a statue, we might want to say, oh, the kind of matter that it's made out of is marble or clay, right? And then the formal cause, and this, I'm simplifying this, is what is its form? But it's kind of like a platonic form, um, not just its shape, but its configuration, its structural configuration, its functional design, right? Now, in the case of a statue, it's just pretty much its shape. But in terms of an acorn, it's what we know nowadays would be the genetics in it that determine its stages of growth, right? The mechanism in it, right? The, the way that that matter is structured has a kind of design in it or a configuration, right? The design accounts for how it functions, right? That's its formal cause. And you could think of Plato's forms, but they're not separate from the world. They're built into, like it's built into the acorn, right? That it's gonna unfold like that little sapling growing down below, right? And of course, nowadays we know diagrams like the, the scientific one up there might explain, you know, carbon structure or whatever that, that, that that's the formal cause, right? Scientific perspective nowadays. Third bullet is its efficient cause, right? What was efficient in triggering the change from that matter's potential to its actual form, right? So, and we could talk about these four causes at every single stage. So the acorn, right? What triggers it to turn into that first little green sprout 
is water, <laughs> right? The water triggers it. When it gets wet, it starts to open up and sprout, right? And how does it get bigger? Nutrients from the soil, more water, but minerals and sunlight, right? And so on, okay? Those are the efficient causes. So to get back to um, the statue, it's made out of clay. The formal cause is the shape that it has, right? It's shaped like a statue of uh, Apollo, let's just say, right? What's its efficient cause? What changed that clay into that shape? That would be the artist, right? Manipulating the clay and putting it into that shape, right? And then the final cause, it's telos, it's purpose, right? Go back here, right? What's the purpose of the acorn? To become an oak tree, right? Well, what was the purpose of the artist creating a statue of the god Apollo from this matter by manipulating it and shaping it into the, the god Apollo statue, right? What's its purpose? Why did that happen? So this is a why question, right? The other things are more like how or what, what kind of stuff is it made out of? What kind of configuration does it have? And you know, I guess they're all what and how, maybe some, some how, right, in the efficient, like how did it change? How did that matter change into that shape or form, right? Well, you could say that as a what or a how question, but why? The telos always asks why, why is that? A statue. Why did the artist or the sculpture make it? Well, why is that an oak tree? Right. Well, it's its purpose. What, what's its purpose? Its purpose was to become an oak tree. The purpose of the statue of Apollo was to place in front of the temple of Apollo in honor of the god in order to hopefully communicate with the god or win favor from the god. Right. That was the purpose. Okay. So Aristotle thought that by analyzing nature, right? And then you could see this kind of similar to the pre-Socratics, right? We see patterns in nature, and then we infer that they apply in more ways than we actually see them applying, right? So Pythagoras saw certain ratios and patterns and he assumed everything is math, right? Thales saw certain patterns with water and he thought everything is water. Aristotle saw, and you know, being a biologist, he invented biology. By the way, most of his classifications are still valid today, and he did not have genetics back then. But in the same way that those pre-Socratic nature philosophers may have overgeneralized based on what they saw empirically, plus with the use of reason, because as a number of my students have pointed out, in their um, little essays about the rationalist versus the empiricist, the empiricist certainly had to use logical arguments or approximate logical arguments to draw inferences like they did, right? For this reason, that reason, and the other reason, it looks like everything is made out of water, or it looks like condensation and evaporation could explain everything, or it looks like everything is fire, or it looks like, right, everything is math. Right, even though only some things appear that way. It's a certain kind of reasoning. It's a scientific kind of reasoning, right? So they were early scientists, but Aristotle makes the same kind of error, I think you'll see, when he thinks that, well, all living things seem to have a telos, a purpose, an end. They are designed to be a certain way and to become a certain way, to actualize their potential in certain ways. But then there's the seasons, there's the tides, there's day and night, there's the harmony in the stars. It all seems to work together. The water cycle with rain, right? Which feeds the plants, which feed the animals, which feed us. Like the whole thing seems to be designed, right? So everything seems to have a telos. This is a brilliant way of explaining all of our experience, right? And Aristotle thought that gravity was that everything that was physical was of the same nature as the earth. And therefore it has built into it a telos to return to the earth, which is why all physical objects fall to the ground, right? When released in the air, gravity. 
So his explanation for gravity was some kind of telos that matter has to reunite with matter. Um, of course, that turned out to be wrong, but a lot of his ideas were brilliant and turned out, well, given what knowledge he did not have then, which we have now, we can say, oh, that was silly or whatever, but back then, smarter than Einstein. Okay. Oh, so good. I have, I just did this example, right? Uh, I already talked about it. I forgot that I had a slide. So yeah, let's take the statue of Apollo, the material it's made out of marble. Its formal properties are its shape, the God Apollo. What chiseled that marble into that shape? The sculptor, that was the trigger. And what was the purpose, the, the final goal, the reason for its being? To place in the temple of Apollo. Okay, so consider that a little recap. That's an example of the four causes. Okay, now I already criticized him by saying that um, he overgeneralized to think that just because all living things seem to have some kind of telos. And I think that's a, that's a good, I, I think that's true. Uh, it doesn't have to be a conscious telos, but it seems to be built into us that we are designed to function in a certain way, right? You can call that a kind of teleological explanation. Um, so that's a criticism that not everything, non-living things, don't seem to have a telos, right? Unless if you believe in some kind of mystical, religious, or theological conception of nature, such that it does have a telos built into it by God or some kind of higher power, but that kind of, um, that's not really empirical thinking. That kind of thinking aside, another criticism is that it's a kind of anthropomorphic projection in the same way that I said, anthropologists might try to explain early humans belief in gods, plural, as a form of anthropomorphic projection, if you recall. Anthropos is man, morphic meaning having the form of so a projection, we project human-like characteristics, like when we think our dog is smiling or something like that, right? We did this with the gods when we thought the sky is angry. We're angry. When we're angry, we are loud and violent. The sky is loud and violent. So the sky is angry, right? And then like ang being angry is a human attribute that we project onto the sky and then we reify it and personalize it by giving it a name. It's, it's a god and its name is Zeus or something like that, right? So I'm saying Aristotle might be like many of these early philosophers were still working through this anthropomorphic projectionism onto nature, right? And assuming that everything we do is for a purpose, right? And using ourselves as Protagoras, ironically, the sophist said, man is the measure of all things, even though Aristotle was against the sophists, he might have been using us as a measure in this regard, because we everything we explain answers some kind of why question. Why is it this way? Why is it that way? And every kind of because answer, right? The answer to every why question begins with because. And every time we use because, what follows that is an explanation, which gives a reason why, right? A because signals a reason why. And giving reasons why for everything is kind of teleological. Why did that happen? Because of this, because of that. So everything seems teleological. Everything that's rational, that makes sense to people like Aristotle appears to be teleological, right? An acorn then seems to intend or try to become an oak tree, right? And like the idea that the oak tree is a potential that lures the acorn toward itself like a magnet, right? Which was another idea from, uh, was it Anaxagoras who thought mind functions like a magnet on matter to make it change forms, right? It looks like Aristotle might have been unconsciously toying around with a lot of these anthropomorphic projections like gravity, right? physical things intend to return to the earth. It's kind of built into our nature, right? It's part of our telos, okay? Um, that we are all goal, we are totally goal oriented. Everything's explained by giving 
reason-based explanations and reason-based explanations are largely teleological. So maybe everything is teleological, telos oriented, goal oriented. Okay, so now let's get back to anthropology, the study of mankind. What is our nature? What is our function? What is our purpose, right? So I've got a little character there aiming an arrow at a goal, right? Just to depict this goal oriented thing. So we're gonna learn two other words here. If you look in the yellow terms in the right, the word ergon and arete or arete, we already learned telos, right? But the word ergon, you've seen that word in ergonomic, which I have in parentheses there, is the function of a thing. What a thing does is its function, right? It's ergon, right? So like a, a really functional chair is one that's designed to work well with the human body. So we call it ergonomic. And nomos, the Greek word means rule or law or principle, right? So it's got a kind of functional principle. It's functional design is made to be lawful or rule-based or following principles that contour and sync well with what's healthy for the human body in a posture of sitting, right? Ergonomic, okay? Ergonomic joysticks might be another example, really well-designed handles on something, okay? Right. They function well, they're ergonomic, right? They're designed to function well. So you can remember the word ergon by just thinking of ergonomic chairs or ergonomic joysticks or whatever, right? So now what is the design or the ergon of a knife? Well, its design reveals its function, right? Its design re reveals its ergon, right? It's sharp, right? It's long, it's pointy. It has that structure. It's got a certain structural design and that design reveals its function. What is it designed to do, right? What a thing does is its function. It's designed to cut, right? That's its purpose, right? So the ergon, the functional design tells you the purpose of the knife, right? To cut, that's the purpose of a knife, right? The arete is a Greek word that translates to the, those three terms you see next to it. It's virtue, which is its kind of excellence or its power, right? What's the virtue, the good purpose, right? Or the good ability of a knife, what is its excellence? What is its power? What kinds of things can it do and do well, right? That's its arete. So virtue is a kind of excellent ability or function, right? So an excellent, powerful, or good, I put good in red because the, for reasons I'll explain shortly, a good knife is a knife that cuts well, right? So, right, what's a good knife? Well, what's a knife? A knife is an instrument designed to cut. So what would be a good knife or an excellent knife or a powerful knife? One that cuts well, that would make it a good knife, right? One that's dull, that the point got worn down, right? It doesn't cut well, it's not a good knife. Sorry, it's not a good knife. Let me get another knife. Can't seem to cut this salami, right? Um, okay, so these are really important. And I'll say a lot more about them shortly. Hopefully your mind is already imagining where this is gonna go, but to figure out the function, the purpose and the excellence or goodness of a thing, we first have to define it. What kind of thing is it? Oh, it's a knife, right? Or whatever, right? So once we know that it's a knife, then we could say whether or not it's a good knife, depending on whether or not it excellently performs its function. If it is capable of succeeding in attaining its, the fulfillment of its purpose, right? 
Okay, so now let's apply this abstract formula for understanding the nature, function, and purpose of a thing to mankind. So this is a generic, much more broad, philosophical, conceptual understanding of the nature, function, and purpose of anything, and that it hinges on what kind of thing it is, right, which is a matter of definition and conceptuality, and so therefore of logic, right? So this is quite objective, right? A cat is a mammal, a mammal is an animal, right? A knife is a cutting instrument, a dull knife is, is not good at cutting, and so on, right? So these are objects, but now we're going to apply it to the study of human beings, anthropology, anthropos and logos, right? Words about human beings. What type of being is man, right? And I say man when I'm talking about Aristotle and the ancient Greeks, because they didn't go in for all this uh, linguistic sensitivity, right? So please forgive me. Uh, and it's also, you know, it would, it would be kind of anachronistic to retroactively superimpose linguistic norms on Aristotle that he didn't that he didn't use, right? It would be misrepresentative, okay? So what type of man is that determines our telos, our purpose? And that's a drawing by um, Leonardo da Vinci over there, by the way, of human beings and some kind of model, almost platonic diagram of some perfectly proportioned human being, right? So you see, we've got three things in bold over there. Man is a social animal, Man is a rational animal, and therefore man is a rational social animal in the third bullet, but let's go through them. What's a social animal? Well, like other social species, schools of fish, chimpanzees, wolves in a pack, parakeets, right? There's various species of animals that we consider social animals. Those are species that need to live in groups in order to flourish, right? Some kinds of animals do fine alone right? They rarely get together except to breed or to raise their young, right? Human infants rarely survive without human contact. That's how social we are. We are socially very dependent on each other for the longest period of time, right? So we are the most socially dependent species that we know of, right? In rare cases where human infants do survive, it's because they were fortunate through some accident to be kind of functionally adopted by some other animal, right? That nursed them or whatever, right? But th those humans who do survive without human contact are called feral, like wild cats or feral cats, right? And they can't, it's almost impossible to domesticate them or even teach them language Right? So there's something about those stages of the acorn before it becomes an oak tree that if a human being in its developmental sequence doesn't have all of its needs met that are prerequisite to becoming the oak tree version of a human being, it can't, right? And sociality is one of the most primary prerequisites to human beings becoming the kinds of beings you see in the Da Vinci diagram there, right? Next and most important thing for Aristotle is, okay, that's the genus in some functional sense, right? What kind of species are we? Social or non-social? Oh, we're social. Okay, so that's the genus. And what differentiates human beings from other social species? Our very high level of intelligence our rationality, right? That's the distinctive feature of humans. For us to survive, we have to use our reasoning. Right? You can imagine that once you have cultivated and become like the man in the diagram there, right? You've reached the oak tree level of being a human that you could probably survive for quite long periods of time, maybe not in a great state of well-being, but decent. Um, without social contact, if necessary, like shipwrecked or something like that, right? Um, but even then, 
on your own, you would need to use your rationality in order to learn how to get food, shelter, protect yourself, remain healthy and all that, right? Unlike a horse, you know, horses are born, they get up and they start eating grass and running around, right? And they could, you know, even though they're a social species, a horse in principle could just run around and eat grass for the rest of its life, even if it wasn't too happy, right? But human beings, we have to use our rationality. We can't just eat whatever's around unless we happen to be in a very, very fortunate part of nature that has just enough, you know, that you can just not have to worry about being eaten and not have to worry about eating, all right? But in general, it's clear what differentiates us from all the other species of animals is that unlike them, we need to use our rationality on a regular basis in order to function well, okay? It's required for our very survival. So Aristotle's definition of human beings is that we are rational social animals, right? The genus is social animal. The species is rational. Man is a rational social animal. Okay, so let's talk about a concept that goes back to Aristotle, which modern philosophers would call, but I don't think he used this term, species typical functioning. It's a good way to understand where Aristotle is going and why he thinks what he thinks about anthropology, human nature, right? So trees are a species of non-animal living organisms, right? And just like the acorn, it needs water and soil and sunlight, right? To become a tree, right? So those are conditions that are necessary for species typical functioning of trees, right? Parakeets need other parakeets and they need to be able to fly. I mean, you could keep a parakeet in a cage, you could clip its wings, never let it out, but it'll flap its wings in there just to kind of simulate flying. And it'll talk to humans, right? It'll try to interact with you and mimic you and all of that. Um, you know, it might be able to minimally survive, but it won't thrive, right? So species typical flourishing might be a better word, but functioning is minimally necessary, right? What's minimally necessary for uh, and typically minimally necessary for members of that species to survive, right? Um, for them to flourish, right? You need more conditions, right? So a parakeet might do okay in a cage with its wings clipped and whatnot, but it might flourish in a much larger cage with a bunch of other parakeets and its wings. And where there's enough room in that cage, like a room-sized cage for it to fly around. Right. And you might think of those zoos like a great adventure or whatever, where it's outdoors. It's like a safari. So the animals are living in the kinds of habitats that are necessary for their not only species typical functioning, but species typical flourishing for them to enjoy well being, living in the natural conditions in which members of that species normally need to live in order to enjoy the kinds of well being that they would enjoy under those circumstances, right? So I know that sounds a little wordy and circular, but okay. So a good person, right? A well-developed or happy person, a flourishing person, a person enjoying well-being as a human, right? Like a good knife is one that performs its function, its ergon excellently at the level of virtue, right? Arete, which is excellence, virtue, power, right? Right. What, what, what are the conditions necessary for a parakeet to be, you know, flourishing or for a human to be flourishing? Well, Aristotle says for a human, since we are rational social animals, right? With the rationality part, we need to exercise our reason, right? In accordance with, you know, standards of excellence, like sharpness for a knife, certain rationality, features of rationality are the equivalent of sharpness for a knife in terms of the sharpness of our human attributes, right? Sharp rationality attributes, you might want to say, right? The exercise of reason in accordance with virtues or excellences of those character traits, right? And because we're social animals, 
right? I was just describing the, ra the rational side of us. Um, we need to be in a well-ordered society, like a city-state, Aristotle thought, that was governed by rational principles, which are the kinds of principles that are designed to support rational social interactions between rational agents or other human beings, right? So right, a, a city and state like Athens or Sparta or whatever, some cities, states more or less approximated that, right? In his day, so he was able to see that interdependence, right? The more rationally designed the society structure was, the more rational and social and excellent the human beings could become in it, right? So, and there's a list of virtues over there, right? Temperance is kind of self-control, wisdom, knowledge, transcendence, which is just kind of finding the deepest meaning in your life, courage, without courage, none of the other virtues can really work, uh, humanity or being humane or friendly or social, justice, fairness, and so on, right? Those are some virtues, right? Therefore, the good or highly functional person possesses all the moral and intellectual virtues. Those are excellences of character, right? Intellectual ones are the rational ones that have more to do with your intelligence individually within your own mind, and the moral ones have to do with your interpersonal intelligence, right? So intrapersonal means within yourself, right? Uh, that's intellectual virtues. Interpersonal between people, that's social, right? So um, those are the moral virtues. So yes, he distinguishes between uh, two types, which we'll, we show at the bottom of the page here. So axiology, now we're moving from anthropology into ethics. Axiology, recall from one of my earliest lectures, right? You've got metaphysics, study of reality, epistemology, study of knowledge. Reality is often you know, simplistically construed as outside the head. Knowledge is simplistically construed as inside the head. Where are values, right? The study of values is axiology. Are they outside the head in the world? Are they inside the head? Are they some kind of interaction between both or a mixture or something else, right? That's the domain of axiology, right? And ethics is one subcategory. Aesthetics is another, the study of judgments of beauty. Ethics is the study of judgments about right and wrong behavior, moral or immoral actions, right? Economics is the study of economic values, the, the values of goods and services and so on, right? So there are different branches of axiology. Ethics is the one that primarily concerns the well-being of humans, right? So the word arete normally means virtue, but it also means excellence and power. So Aristotle's particular kind of ethics is called virtue theory, right? Because he puts a primary emphasis on developing character traits that count as virtues, as opposed to later ethical theories, which might be more rule-based, like follow the Ten Commandments or the Golden Rule, right? Um, or some other principle, right? Aristotle is the founder, at least in Western culture, of the virtue theory of ethics. That what is ethics all about? It's about identifying what are all the capabilities of human beings, rational and social capabilities, and figuring out how to develop them to excellence levels so that we maximize our powers and abilities as human beings. And then we flourish as the kinds of beings that we are and we can enjoy lasting, deep, constitutive or constitutional well-being. We'll be structured as the kinds of beings who will experience well-being all the time, which is happiness or eudaimonia, eudaimonia, happiness in the, in the broader sense, not just momentary happiness, right? So virtues are excellences of character that make for highly functional people in a well-ordered society, right? And like I said before, there are two types of virtues for Aristotle, moral and intellectual, and let's look at those. So once again, the moral virtues are the social ones. By social, we mean interpersonal, right? How I treat you. 
right? Psychology is about my own mind. Sociology is about how minds interact with each other, right? How do humans behave with each other? That's sociology. Psychology is how does an individual behave on his own, right? It's just different le lenses of analysis, right? So the moral virtues are the social ones, the interpersonal ones, the, the, the principles and the traits um, which have to do with how we treat each other, right? So these are character traits that wind up on a list that gets a check mark, mark, meaning they are positive character traits and another name for a positive character trait is a virtue, right? So generosity is a virtue, right? Being generous, being friendly is a virtue, being compassionate, you know, feeling sorry for somebody and trying, perhaps trying to help them or whatever when they are in need. Courage is, is an important virtue, right? Which comes from the word core, which means your core, your heart, right? Courage is hardiness or fearlessness, right? Or at least a certain amount of fearlessness. Forgiveness, right? Being able to realize that other people are imperfect like you are and cutting them some slack when they deserve it. Loyalty, right? Not backstabbing people and being phony and two-faced, right? Being trustworthy is related to being loyal, right? Do you lie a lot, making you untrustworthy or do you break promises or engage in manipulative, deceitful behaviors? Are you honest, right? So here's a list of moral virtues, et cetera, because there's a lot more of them, depending on how you look at it. And here's a list of intellectual virtues or individual or intra, intra means within, intrapersonal, right? Interpersonal is between people, intra is within, right? So truthfulness, right? You can be truthful with yourself, right? Of course, honesty is being truthful with others, right? Because some of them overlap and can be in both categories and have a value in both categories, right? But being truthful with yourself, admitting your flaws or what you did wrong or whatever, right, is, is a kind of internal truthfulness. Humility, which is like kind of the opposite of being like obnoxiously aggressive, right? And, you know, have an inflated ego and be a megalomaniac and all that kind of thing, right? Thinking that you're really greater than you are, right? You lack humility, right? Humility is some kind of recognition, ability to recognize your limitations, right? Curiosity, right? Just as a mind, if you lack curiosity, you're lacking a crucial ability that human beings can have. You have the capacity for it, Right? We have capacities that we don't develop into abilities. Right? You have to exercise a capacity, which is a potential, right? in order to develop the ability to exercise that capacity. Right? So you might want to think of abilities as exercised capacities. Are you able to ride a bike? Yes, I am. Right? Well, I've never ridden a bike. I'm capable of learning how to, but I've never done it, let's just say. Right? So when it comes to curiosity, you might want to think of all these different categories of character traits as tools, as kind of psycho technologies, you might want to call them. Like a hammer is a physical technology, uh, but it's also a psycho technology because it's, it's a tool that you can use, right? That makes it a technology to solve certain problems, like to drive in nails or to remove them, right? So it's a tool that you can use to solve certain problems. So you might wanna think of all of our character traits like tools or potential or the capacities that we have to develop various abilities, right? Each one of them is a potential tool that we could have in our cognitive uh, and our, our toolkit as agents, right? As beings in the world, acting on the world to satisfy our needs and achieve our goals, right? If you lack curiosity, you are lacking a very important philosophical tool, right? How does that work? What is that? Why did that happen, right? Those are all examples of curiosity in action. Almost all knowledge 
comes to us directly or indirectly through our curiosity or others' curiosity. Enthusiasm, right? If you lack enthusiasm, right? You're missing out on enjoyment in life just as a mind, right? Being able to appreciate and be interested in things in a way which is intrinsically rewarding, right? Is to be able to be enthusiastic about whatever it is that you're doing or exploring, right? So enthusiasm, like you could probably get by without it, but having it is a tool because if you bring enthusiasm to anything that you're doing, you will do it well, whether it's learning, building, creating, discussing, analyzing, whatever, or even destroying, right? Knocking down an old shed to build a new one. You might really enjoy taking an ax to it and cut it down with enthusiasm or a tree or whatever, understanding, right? Your ability to understand is certainly a cognitive tool, right? So if you have very good understanding, right? That's an intellectual virtue. Being analytical, being able to analyze things the way Aristotle analyzes things and categorizes them and classifies them and creates a whole taxonomies of things, right? That's a tremendously analytical mind, right? So analytic ability is the ability to identify the ways in which things are alike and the ways in which they differ and how they relate to each other on multiple levels is a tremendous cognitive tool. Being judicious is being able to make good judgments even when the conditions present in the thing to be assessed or judged are vague and fuzzy and unclear and complicated, right? Like King Solomon in the classic story, two women both claiming to be the mother of the same baby. Solomon says to one of his assistants, get me my sword. I will cut this baby in half and give each of these women their fair share. And one woman says, no, no, never mind. I withdraw my claim. Let her have it. And Solomon uses this to form the good judgment that that's probably the true mother, right? Whether or not it's guaranteed, but it exhibits what's called judiciousness, right? He seems to have good judgment. Um, the joke on that one goes like this. Two mothers are claiming that this young man in front of them, in front of King Solomon, promised to marry each of their daughters, right? And King Solomon says to his assistant, get me my sword. I will cut this man in half and each of their daughters can marry half of him, right? And one woman says, no, 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 don't do that. Let her daughter have him. And King Solomon says, okay, right? And then his assistant says, but King Solomon, when it was the baby, you, you let the woman who said that have it, right? And King Solomon said, yes. But in this case, the true mother-in-law is the one who would let her son-in-law be cut in half. So she's the one who can have him. <laughs> That's a joke. All right. <laughs> I hope you were intelligent enough to get that joke because intelligence is certainly an intellectual virtue. Creativity is, there's a lot more. I hope you get the idea, right? Intellectual empathy, cognitive empathy, being able to see something from someone else's perspective, having confidence in your own reason, having intellectual integrity, right? Being honest with yourself, intellectual autonomy, thinking for yourself, intellectual courage, right? You believe an unpopular view, but you're not afraid to accept it, admit that you think it's true, and perhaps even, you know, announce it to others, being fair-minded, being having perseverance, 
right? And so on. Those are all in the little diagram there, right? So the list goes on and on and on. Okay. Now, Aristotle thought, as I think did Socrates and Plato, but for different reasons, that there's a unity of the virtues, which you see in the top arrow. And what unites them is what's in the center, wisdom. Wisdom is the highest virtue. It includes all the others, right? And the doctrine of the unity of the virtues, I think I mentioned it when I was talking about Socrates in Plato's Euthyphro dialogue, when we said that though they're talking about holiness or piety, the, the argument or the conversation applies to all the virtues because the Greeks thought that they were united, that if you truly had any one of them, you'd have to have all of them, right? But what they're united in is virtue. Um, sorry, wisdom. Well, the virtues are united in wisdom. They're interdependent. It's like you can't have one completely without having all the other ones. Motion, moral virtues and mind virtues. Mind skills or intellectual virtues moral or social skills, right? The eudaimon, which is the person who possesses eudaimonia or true happiness, possesses all the virtues in good measure. Why is wisdom the highest? Because with wisdom, you have the good judgment to be able to calibrate all of the other ones and apply them appropriately in every distinct, different, unique context or set of conditions that normally arises because no two cases are ever completely alike, right? which is another one of the reasons why virtue theorists think that rule-based systems of morals or principles-based systems of morals can't fully work because although like cases ought to be treated alike, cases are rarely fully alike, right? They almost always involve unique constellation of factors. So to have a fully wise judgment requires not just an ability to manipulate algorithms or rules, right? But a kind of gestalt level wisdom that can kind of bring all the small details up to the, the main perspective and then also come back down in a kind of reciprocal fashion where there's a data to theory and a theory to data back and forth equilibrium going on, which that kind of cyclical mechanism is probably a good functional description of what wisdom is itself in terms of cognitive science, in terms of the mind, okay? Okay, so let's get back to um, the goal of it all for human beings, eudaimonia, happiness, right? So, oh yeah, I thought, I broke down the word eudaimonia earlier in the lecture, but I, I wanted to remind you that Socrates said he had a daemon in him, right? A spirit in him that guided him to do the right thing because he was a eudaimon, I would say. He was good spirited. He had wisdom, right? And although the word eudaimonia is often translated as happiness, and literally it means being good spirited, having a good attitude, being humane, being wise, being integrated, being righteous, Right, a righteous man, like what Euthyphro and Socrates were trying to figure out what makes them righteous, is humane, wise, good-spirited, right? Benevolent, good-natured is a simpler way to put it, right? Well-adjusted, wholesome, flourishing human being. Not the same as the modern notion of happiness, which is more based on that word hedonism, Right, a hedonistic person is somebody who just chases after pleasures. Wine, women, and song, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know, video games, uh, selfies. Uh, I'm joking around now, teasing your generation. You know, when I was your age, I was guilty of worse, probably. But we'll leave me out of it for now. All right, this is not the moment, the, the modern momentary notion of happiness, right? Which is depending on having certain things and being in certain moods, right? A eudaimon, right? A model human being, like in the Da Vinci drawing, let's just say, can have a bad day and still regain or retain happiness. They are optimally functioning and flourishing as the kind of being they are according to their ergon, their design, their telos, their purpose. That's Aristotle's theory. Uh, it's a blend of anthropology and ethics, okay? 
important. I said, I put the word good the first time you saw it in my lecture today in red and bold. And I said, we'll talk more about why this matters later on. Okay. So Aristotle's concept of moral values is both objective and relative in a sense, right? Look, nowadays, most people, not just your generation, but the last two or three generations have been kind of indoctrinated in a cultural mindset of relativism and subjectivism, as if the two go hand in hand, right? It's all relative. It all depends. That's your perspective. That's my perspective. To each his own. Everybody's opinion matters, right? We're all equal. All that's kind of subjective. It's all subjective. There's no objective truth. There's no right or wrong. It's all kind of relative. It's all subjective, right? Um, you know, cultural relativism is, is, is standardly promulgated as if it's a fact in sociology and anthropology and other kinds of courses. Well, maybe not all of them, but in many of them, your instructors might give you the impression that it's a kind of scientifically established fact that moral values and moral rules and moral norms vary from culture to culture. What's considered moral in one culture is considered immoral in another, and that's all there is to it. There's no objective. You couldn't have an objective standard because whatever standard you like, you're picking that one from within your mindset, which is within your culture's, you know, ideological framework, and you're using your standard to judge another culture's. There's no standard outside of your frame of reference, or as um, philosopher Thomas Nagel put it in a book with this title, there's no such thing as a quote, the view from nowhere, right? Every view is situated somewhere, culturally, historically, in terms of your identity, you know, all that stuff determines what kinds of norms and values and morals you have. And there's nothing outside of that that's some independent standard. This is what the sophists thought, if you recall. It's all relative, right? Homo mensura, man is the measure. And different men measure things differently. Works for you, doesn't for me. When in Rome, do as the Romans do, right? That's a, that's a cultural relativism motto, okay? The idea that there's something objectively true, well, math is a standard example of things that are objectively true. Two plus two is four, no matter what language you speak or what culture you're from. Or if you're awake or dreaming, it's still the case that two dreamt apples plus two more dreamt apples equals four dreamt ap apples, right? That's just as those two and two real apples equals four real apples, right? Okay, so Aristotle's analysis, however, rejects this idea that relative implies subjective right? Well, relative to our group, it's group subjective. Or, you know, we view ham as not kosher. Well, we view ham as kosher, right? Like, it's okay for us to eat ham. No, it's not, right? Oh, well, well, there's no truth to the matter. It's just that's the way you guys think about it. And that's the way us guys think about it, or you girls, depending on what the group is, or what the subject matter is, right? So the idea that relativism and subjectivity go hand in hand right? It's like subjective relativism. If it's cultural relativism, then it's group subjective subjectivity or group relativism relative to the group or group subjective. The whole group thinks that way. Group think. That's how we think about it. Individual relativism is, well, that's how I feel about it. That's individual subjectivism. So it's either individual relativism and subjectivism relative to me. It's true for me, right? Uh, broccoli is disgusting not for you, or group relativism. Ham is unacceptable. No, ham is acceptable, right? Depends on what group you're in. In both cases, subjective and relative mean the same thing. Well, for Aristotle, no, they don't, right? You could have things that are relative and in an objective sense. Okay, well, it's objectively true that in New York, the law is that you can't drink alcohol under age 21. Right? That's objectively true. So there are objective ways of describing. It's true that the natives of Alaska used to consider infanticide morally acceptable. And it's true that the natives in some other country don't, right? Okay, so that's, that's one level descriptive. It's true descriptively that these people have this norm, those people have that norm. 
right? But it doesn't follow that there's no such thing as objective norms in some sense. It might almost sound oxymoronic because a norm just seems to be what's considered normal by a group. What's the average attitude toward it, right? All right, so let's, let's try and see this now from Aristotle's perspective. The ergon is the functional design of a thing enabling its purpose, its telos, right? Like a hammer, a screwdriver, a saw, a knife, and a spoon are all designed differently to function in different ways, which are the purpose for those tools being designed the way that they're designed, right? They have distinct designs. Their functions are objective features of those designs, and so are their purposes, right? Okay, so relative to the purpose of removing a screw, right? You would not use a spoon and so on, okay? Those are objective. Same thing with a chair, a bed, a table, or a ladder. Each one has a different structural design, which enables it to function in a way to achieve the purpose for which it was designed, right? Same thing with your kidney, your brain, your heart, and your lung. Same thing with a fruit, an egg, an acorn, or a person, right? It, these are objective features of these objects or entities, right? That they are built with certain kinds of structural designs so that they can function in order to attain the purposes for which they were designed, okay? Right? That's the powers or excellences or virtues that they have, right? The power of an excellent knife is its virtue, its ability to cut, right? The knife's ergon, design is cutting instrument. Its excellence is if it can cut well, then it's an excellent knife, right? A good knife is a knife that cuts well. An excellent knife is a knife that cuts excellently, right? Okay. What features of the knife make it excellent? Those are objective. It's sharp, it's pointy, it has an ergonomic handle, right? Whatever those things are, those are objective features of a knife and it's objectively true that those features enable the knife to cut well, which is its objective purpose, right? So even though goodness, right? is relative or virtues or excellences are relative to the kinds of things that different things are, right? Different characteristics make a chair a good chair than the characteristics that make a good heart a good heart or a good egg a good egg, right? So those are all relative, right? So goodness or excellence is always relative to what kind of thing the thing in question is, whether or not it's good or bad, right? So that's an objective factual matter and it's relative. It's relative to the structural design and telos, the ergon and telos of a thing, right? It's structural design, it's function and it's purpose as that kind of thing determine objectively and factually what conditions it needs to have in order for it to be a good one a good X, whatever that X is, a knife, a fruit, an acorn, a ladder, right? A good person is just like a good knife in that regard, right? Just as a knife has all of its capacities developed to excellent levels in order to be a good knife, a human being has all of its capacities developed to excellent levels, maximal powers, of all those potential tools in the toolkit, the cognitive toolkit of what it is to be a human being, those moral and intellectual character traits, when they are all, those capacities are developed to virtue level excellences and powers, that's a eudaimon. That's a model human being. That's a good human being, right? That's, and, and that's objective, right? There's nothing subjective about it. Yes, it's relative. Being a good human is different from being a good snail, right? Or a good avocado, right? It all depends. Yeah, it all depends, but that does not in any way, shape or form justify thinking that anything in these categories is subjective. There might be some things that are subjective, like 
liking or disliking the taste of broccoli tends to be subjective. That varies from person to person, but the greenness of broccoli or the fact that it's a vegetable don't vary from person to person, right? As the former, was a governor or some a governmental official in New York, I forget what role he had, Daniel Moynihan, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, uh, senator or something, I think it was the senator, many years ago said, yes, everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but no one is entitled to their own facts. Remember that, that's an Aristotelian point, okay? Okay, now, what makes something a virtue? Aristotle has a doctrine called the doctrine of the golden mean, which by the way, one of the Asian philosophers we will study will have that as well but I won't say who it is now. And the mean is something like the middle or the average, but not exactly. It's some, some kind of midpoint or balance, right? But the, there are simple ways of interpreting that that are misleading. So just kind of try to keep a, a more open mind than just thinking it's literally a mathematical middle uh, or average or anything like that. Right, but the doctrine of the golden mean is Aristotle's formulaic way of defining. It's a procedure for figuring out of any particular character trait, whether or not, and to what extent it is a virtue or it has reached its excellence level, right? And his doctrine goes like this. So virtue is the midpoint between extremes, right? Extremes are too much or too little, or on the, the graph up there, too little is a deficiency on the left-hand side, and too much is an excess, right? And the mean is neither too little nor too much, but just the right amount, right? It's perfectly well calibrated. What does calibrated mean? If you go to get on your scale and the the, the dial is not on zero, or if you're using one of those medical scales with the bar, right, um, and it, it's not even, it's leaning down or it's leaning up, and you've got to adjust the knob to get it to not be touching the top or the bottom on the medical scale, right? That's calibrating it. If it's a stand-on scale in your bathroom with the little, you know, arrow, you got to adjust the dial down there to get the, do the, the dial to point to zero before you get on. You've calibrated it so that it's working well. It will properly weigh you, right? So this is what he means by calibrating the midpoint, right? So take courage, for example. It's a, he would describe it as the right amount of fear, and fear he would probably describe as the right amount of awareness of danger and willingness to engage with it when necessary, right? So foolhardiness, Aristotle says, is when you don't have enough fear. You're too fearless, right? You need a little fear, right? Um, paranoid is you have too much fear. You're cowardly. You're afraid to go out, right? Sometimes you need to face the bully, right? So having the right amount of awareness of danger and being able to interact with it is courage, right? Heartedness, quare, the heart, courage, right? Courage is the warrior's key virtue, right? And if you practice martial arts, you practice getting up close and personal with danger, right? And, but you don't overdo it Right in my dojo, when I was learning Shotokan karate, my sensei, my teacher, Sensei Warren K, may he rest in peace, had us train with real knives, right? But not real guns. All right, we trained with water guns to try to disarm somebody, a gunman, right? But by engaging and by fighting and sparring and whatnot, you, you, you are practicing engaging with courage until you get it right. You don't want to get so close so that you're vulnerable, but so far away that you can't strike. You know, it, it all depends. And the, the circumstances are moving and changing and it's a kind of dance. And the more you practice, the better you get at it, right? So you need to be appropriately aware of and responsive to danger 
to be a good fighter, let's just say. Avoidance of the sword is good, but not at such a distance that you can't strike, right? That involves just the right amount of fear, the appropriate awareness of danger. So that's the classical example um, to get you started on understanding the doctrine of the golden mean. Uh, let me just want to see something here. Yes, okay, let me go back. Okay, so I put a little thing in here about the well-ordered society, and there's a kind of catch-22 that I thought I should mention. Plato made the same argument, right? And I think Aristotle agrees. For a society to be a well-ordered society, most of the citizens must be well-ordered individuals. They must be virtuous. They must be good-natured. But to become virtuous individuals, citizens, requires a well-ordered society that supports individuals becoming good-natured, right? Now, just to get the intuitive grasp of this idea, how there's an interdependence between being a good person and being in a good society and vice versa. Compare a society filled with corrupt leaders and corrupt citizens or being in a ghetto that's overrun by drug lords or in a war zone, right? Or during a riot where all the rule of law breaks down and the social expectations are out the window, right? Confucius faced the same problem and we'll talk about him, uh, of course, when we get to Asian philosophy. But this was an idea that Plato and Aristotle seem to agree on. There's a kind of catch-22. You can't become a model human being. Well, you can't do it as easily in a society that doesn't support that. And the, one of the examples I like to use is the Kingsborough bus stop. Uh, for those of you who uh, ever do commute to the college and take the bus, if you get on in a nice neighborhood, People stand on line waiting for the bus to come. And when the doors open, they enter in the line in the sequence of being online, right? That's a well-ordered mini society, right? But on the way home at Kingsborough, for whatever reason, people cluster around where the doors are gonna open up front and back. Even if people get there and try to form a line, the cluster overpowers the line. And when the doors open, it's a bum rush to see who can force their way in right? So in that circumstance, it's hard to be a gentleman, let's just say, right? It's hard to exhibit interpersonal social virtues in that kind of environment where no one else is doing it, right? That kind of thing. So I just thought I'd mention that it's an important thing to note. And there's a kind of little bit about preaching so that whenever you are in a situation where your behavior can support there being a line at the bus stop, you should do it, right? Rather than support the movement in the other direction, uh, the bum rushing without the line, the cluster instead of the line, right? End of moral preaching, next slide. Okay, intellectual virtues, mental ones, can be learned and developed through education, Aristotle thought, right? And book learning reading, studying, thinking, doing logic puzzles, all that. Moral virtues, right? Character traits are cultivated through practice, right? Just like courage is developed by engaging in courageous actions or generosity as a trait is developed by practicing giving things away, right? Um, courage is developed by engaging in courageous situations like martial arts training, like I mentioned before. Right? How do you become courageous? By fighting a lot, <laughs> right? Well, that's in the, in the physical sense of physically courageous, but also verbally courageous by opening up your mouth and saying what you think, even when you know that doing so might have negative repercussions for you, but being honest and truthful is more important to you than being safe, let's just say, right? Okay. So Aristotle's analogy is that the good, good, good guitar player becomes good at playing the guitar. How? By playing the guitar, right? That's practice, practice, practice. Drills, exercises, routines. How does someone become a good athlete? No matter how good they are, they practice to keep up their skill levels, right? Same thing with anything else, right? Practice. So you, you become good at playing the guitar by playing the guitar. But as Udo would say, 
you've got to, and Aristotle would say too, you've got to tune the strings just right. If they're too loose or too tight, they won't make music, right? So it's not, we're simplifying things. There's a lot of things that go into it. Okay, so a little more of an element of preaching. Most of you are too young to have kids, but many of you will, maybe even soon. So the well-ordered society must educate children, not only intellectually, but morally for Aristotle and for Plato, right? Especially given that catch 22, we need to have a, a society in which most people are moral and in which the society itself is structured in a way that supports moral behavior, right? And both Plato and Aristotle thought that the way to do that is through educating the next generation the right way so that you raise up a whole bunch of moral people, right? So moral virtues must be inculcated in children. Why also? Because by playing the guitar a lot, that's how you learn to play the guitar well, right? So by practicing moral virtues as a kid growing up, you become good at it just in the same way that this karate kid here, Jaden, um, Smith in the movie, The Karate Kid, the, the newer movie, The Karate Kid, um, right? Cultivates the ability to fight well by practicing that ability, right? One of the good things about martial arts training, by the way, is why you might see a lot of kids in martial arts because their parents realize this, what I'm about to say, is that perseverance discipline, courage, and all the other incidental values that come along with those things are cultivated in martial arts training for children. Self-control, emotional self-regulation, right? There's a whole bunch of excellent moral and intellectual skills that are cultivated through routine martial arts training for children, right? So I put that up there as an example. But by analogy, an educational system that would also cultivate all sorts of moral and intellectual virtues in children would be a great thing for society. Unfortunately, our educational system has adopted some kind of value neutral philosophy where we think that because it's all relative and subjective, None of us has a right to impose our, let's just say, Judeo-Christian or Jewish or Christian or Muslim or this or that values on anybody else. And that's a misconception about values being necessarily tied to a culture or a religion, as Aristotle would say, no. Values are tied to what kind of creature you are. We're all human beings, so we all have the same moral traits moral and intellectual virtues that should be developed for us to reach excellent levels of the kinds of beings that we are. Therefore, from Aristotle's point of view, our value net neutral education is a cause of the destruction of our society, right? And it makes some sense if you think about it. The widespread belief that it's all relative and subjective and nobody has a right and everybody's opinion is equal, not really great. I make the analogy, just like good crops must be properly cultivated from seed level, right? Like human beings, if they don't learn social interaction skills, they can't learn language as infants, right? If they don't get this stuff by age five or something like that, they can almost never get it, right? This is the developmental sequence that's necessary for human beings to become oak tree versions of our little acorn selves. Right? So just like good crops must be properly cultivated from the seed sapling level up, right? Um, so must good people. That's an Aristotelian argument, not a Repetti argument. Okay, the model person and society, model society is the eudaimon. He has all fully developed capacities. He's a kind of perfect human or she, right? And remember Plato thought, I think I mentioned this, perfect human could be a she or a he. And the leader of society could be either. It depends, right? He was a kind of egalitarian between the sexes or a feminist, to use a, pro, a, a, a modern term, right? Well-ordered society supports and requires the full development of individual human. It supports it and requires it and expects it, right? 
And when you attain that state of being, it's intrinsically rewarding just to be a eudaimon, a well-ordered, good-spirited human being is its own reward. It's not a state of having things and seeking and becoming and grabbing at and owning and tasting, right? Not that those things are inconsistent with being a good person, right? But it's not about those things, okay? Wealth and pleasure from Aristotle's point of view are consequences of being in a state of eudaimonia, right? Plus luck, uh, uh, you know, some things are out of our control, right? But more important is to be a eudaimon, right? A wholesome, good-natured human being, right? than to be wealthy and miserable, let's just say, or snort a lot of cocaine and disintegrate as a person, right? Morally and socially. Um, even if snorting a lot of cocaine gives you a lot of temporary pleasure, right? It's not the other way around, right? Money and pleasure do not equal happiness, right? And that's not just, oh, you know, money can't buy me love. This is a deeper Aristotelian explanation for this richer conception of what it means to be a wholesome, healthy, flourishing, well-ordered human being, right? The opposite theory that says money and pleasure matters more, right? Get it while it's hot is called hedonism. A hedon is a feeling. It's a Greek word that means feeling, right? It's just pleasure oriented. Having things, getting them, experiencing them, tasting them, that's hedonism. Hedonism is having and getting and experiencing oriented eudaimonia or eudaimonistic model of happiness uh, or of ethics is a kind of being oriented thing, right? You are in a state of being which is inherently intrinsically rewarding and satisfying in and of itself because it is the fulfillment of what it is to be the kind of thing that you are, okay? And that's about it. So, um, I'll say one more thing. Aristotle said it's the end, but speaking of the end, right? There's the tombstone there. Aristotle said it ain't over till it's over in so many words. Like, you know, you could be, you know, moving toward full oak treeness, the human analogy of it, right? Eudaimonia spreads across your entire lifetime, ideally, right? But you could really screw up before you die. Right. And like in the last even month of your life, just ruin yourself as a person, let's just say, right? And lose your eudaimonia. Aristotle thought the whole thing has to be that way. I mean, you could have challenges as a sapling and all of that, but by the time you reach the end, you should be a you don't meet a eudaimon until the final moment. And if you're kicking and screaming like a big crybaby, um, afraid of death and all that and act desperate in all sorts of silly ways, right? You will have tossed away your deeper happiness. All right, I hope that you learned something from all of this and I will stop to share. Just to say, um, Aristotle is one of the most important thinkers in the history of Western philosophy. Doesn't mean everything that he said was right. Um, I mentioned earlier, but I'll add this, that in the modern age, in the Renaissance age, thanks to Galileo, Galileo basically killed Aristotle, in a sense, um, because he removed the idea of telos from the physical universe. Planets and bowling balls and gravity and all non-living things function according to mechanical laws, of cause and effect, right? Newton's laws are a kind of example of the mechanical model of the universe. The teleological model, which made sense for well over a thousand years in the West, came to be disregarded uh, as part of the scientific revolution in the modern era once the Renaissance began. Um, that's about all I have to say about Aristotle. All right. Once again, I hope that was useful.